Hi everybody, I'm Adrian from Cashering Your Life. Welcome to our Pesach meal planning. Um, just to help you get your meal plan underway and to help you save some money over Pesach. Um, Pesach is an expensive hug as much as I love it. It can get quite costly. So I'm hoping that my, excuse me, moving around like this. I'm hoping that this will help you. One of the first things that we need to understand with Pesach is that it's a different meal to any other one that we have, different to Friday nights and different to other Yom Tevin. The reason obviously is because of the Seder that leads up to the meal. So the first thing you need to know with pretty much any meal plan when you are planning for any Chag is how many people are you having? So for, the, for this talk, I'm counting on 10 people. Okay. How do you work out what do you need? Well, a box of matzah. I'm basing this on the size of a Rakuzin's matzah, and you would need half a box per person. There are two envelopes in there, and there are five in each. And depending on who you are, you would need a few pieces for the whole Seder, plus you would need a few extra for during the week. So, and that's something we forget about during Pesach. We forget the rest of the week. We remember the young we remember the first two nights of Seder, but there's a whole lot of other days that we have to count in. So you need to make sure that you will have enough matzah for during the week as well as for the last two days. Then you need to work out for your Seder night specifically grape juice. It works out to one 750 ml bottle per guest for your four cups of wine. That's how much it's going to be. Then also, besides your grape juice, people are going to need something to drink. Um, to work that out, it works out one to two glasses per hour per guest. So try not to make your Seder much long, too long. Otherwise, they're going to be drinking cold drink for a long time. Your Seder plate, you need your karoset. You need your shank bone or your chicken neck. You'll need your egg your crane or whichever you use, the romaine lettuce or the horseradish itself, and your parsley or your boiled potato. Remember one boiled potato you, makes for eight people because they only need a small piece. If you're using baby potatoes, then each person gets one potato That's the, and a little bit of salt water. When you are planning your egg, also the egg and salt water, it's half an egg per person. If you're adding an onion, it's a quarter onion per person. Don't forget, very important if you've got small children, your Afrikoman prize. That is going to make a difference, obviously, to your Seder. And your animals for your plagues, you need, don't forget your plagues. Then what I found is that something that we all, I don't know if we're in doctrine to it or what it is, we over cater. People have had matzah and grape juice or wine leading up to the meal. We've had an hour, hour and a half, two hours, depending on how long it takes you to get there, of food. I know it doesn't feel like food, it's matzah and lettuce, but it is still food. And having too many choices on the table, I think people overeat and then everybody, I hear it all the time, I ate too much, I ate too much. Or from the hostess is I've got so much leftovers. Maybe nobody ate it, liked it, forgetting that they might have just been full. So it's important to decide how much you're going to serve. I've cut down. We have three starters or three fish as a starter. Uh, gefilte fish, because if I don't serve gefilte fish, my family would riot. And then chopped herring and Danish herring. Depending on who my guests are, I sometimes only serve two of the fish. So first night Seder, I will have gefilte fish and chopped herring. And second night Seder, I will have gefilte fish and Danish herring. For those who serve fried fish, it's one piece of fish per person. Then your salad. Now, salad is a, a tough one of a Pesach for me. I'm not a salad maker. So, and I don't want to serve a green salad because we've just had so much lettuce. Nobody wants the green salad. So you need to look at other ideas. Just having a plain beetroot salad would work or trying something 
like a spinach and orange with some nuts would also work well. Those are interesting salads or papaya. Those are some different types of salads that people would eat. You serve at the same time with your fish. Then you're going to have your soup. Now, for those who are having soup with playla, obviously we're having a hot soup. It would be, some, and traditionally chicken soup. But tomato soup goes well with um, knedlach and so does butternut, just for some different ideas. But if you're not serving knedlach for your seders, then why not try something a little different? In my house, baby marrow soup goes down really well, or even a borscht, a, a beetroot soup for your starter. And then depending on what kind of knedlach you like, um, during seder, I must admit, I tend to only have plain knedlach and the mincemeat stuffed ones for during the week as a meal on its own. People have also got into the habit of serving two different main courses. They'll have meat and chicken. It's not necessary. People won't eat any, as much, and then you've got all this food left over. And I know of a Pesach, it's quite easy because you're going to have visitors or there's gonna be leftovers, and we seem to feel that there's not enough food over Pesach. So we've got to cook extra. And, and every year Pesach, I land up with all these leftovers that are now got to work out how do I get it to change over from Pesach to Chomet. So I've started now serving either fish, sorry, either meat or chicken. So first night will be my roast or my meat. And second night will be my chicken. And I work it out. I'll give you the measurements later on. But I buy a big enough roast, to slice it up and serve it for first night. And then unless I've got somebody who specifically doesn't eat red meat, I'll put chicken aside there and I'll make that just for them. Or if I have a family coming and they all only eat chicken, then I'll serve chicken on that night and then the meat the next night. You need one starch veg. Potato, butternut, sweet potato. There are so many out there. But we're all fixated on rice that we go into a little bit of a panic when you can't have rice. For those who want quinoa or who use quinoa over Pesach, then that's fine too. And then two vegetables. Um, for another thing, for some reason, everybody seems to think there's no vegetables available over Pesach. But it's easy. Carrots, gem squash, baby marrow zucchinis, depending on the size you can get, roasted vegetables, roast, butternut, onion, potato, and beetroot make a great medley for roasting. So those are things. And now if you want a second salad, a green salad would work well. People have sort of forgotten or gone past their romaine lettuce experience and will eat a green salad now. For your dessert, I like to serve a sweet and a not, I wouldn't say savory, but a fruit dessert, a lighter dessert. And I remember in the beginning, I used to make this ton of ice cream. And I would always, I mean, it would last me the whole of Pesach because I'd made so much. I've learned now that for, for a Seder of 10 people, you would only need about two liters. Because first of all, not everybody's gonna eat ice cream. Some people prefer just the fruit. And everybody's full by the time you get to dessert. It's, it's been a long meal. So fruit salad and ice cream to end. Now, I'm just going to show you quickly how I plan my menu. So I've already got it up here. Let me just share it with you. There we go. You can see on the two different screens, this side is on the left-hand side is my recipe for my mayonnaise, which you can find on my website at any time. It's there up for you. Then this side, let me just put, take this off because I'll explain that now. On this side is my shopping list. So it says eggs. So I've written eggs and I put my quantity in and I'll show you why just now. I need vinegar, so there's my white vinegar. I need sugar. Now it's not necessary to put quantities in because you're gonna need these for other recipes. I need salt, I need black pepper, and I need oil. Depending on what kind of oil you need, 
you use would depend on how much oil you're going to buy for your Pesach, for the whole of Pesach. Those are my main ingredients. And as you can see here, I've got them written down. But now I want to make supper. So my Seder is going to consist of my chicken, my chicken soup. So there are my chicken giblets. I need, a pota I need potato, parsnips, celery, turnips, tomato, and ginger for my chicken soup. That's all there. My meat, I'm doing a bolo. I've got 10 people, so two kilos, because a roast with a boneless roast, you work it out at about 200 grams per person. I want to make my, this chutney roast. So I need chutney. I'll explain the asterisks just now. And I need my diet cola. I need salt and pepper, but that's already on my list, so I don't have to rewrite that. Now, with the chutney, if you're not buying chutney, if you're making your own chutney, which is why I put the asterisk there to remind me that I still need to capture my recipe for the chutney and add it onto my shopping list. Okay. So if you're just buying a bottle of chutney, then just write chutney. But for me, that's to remind me that there's still more ingredients that I need to put on. And for my chutney, vinegar and sugar and salt are part of it. So I don't have to rewrite that. Then I need lettuce. I need lettuce for my normal salad, but I'm also going to need lettuce for my cider plate. So that's the reminder there. And that's how I work out my recipes as I go along. So I'm now having gem squash as one of my veg, and I'm going to do a potato cool. So I've already got potatoes on, but now I need, I've got 10 people. I'm working half a potato per person for my main course. So for the Seder plate uh, and for the soup, let's say I need three there. Let's do it this way. One for the soup, uh, my soup, plus two for my Seder plate. And now I'm making a potato kugel for 10 people. So I need another five. So that will enable me to buy the correct amount. If you don't want to buy, well, which is what I'm going to do is the nine kilo bag or seven kilo bag, because I will use all of that. But if you're a small family, you don't want to have to buy all that and then the potatoes start growing eyes. So that, that's quite an important part. Gem squash, I've got 10 people. We're doing half a gem squash, so I need five gem squash. That's just first night, so I haven't gone to second night. I'm also going to have, besides my potato cool, let's say carrots. So carrots, you work out a quarter cup per person of diced carrots. So it works out to about half a kilo for 10 people. So there's, let's put the carrots here. And it is 500 grams. So I need one bag. I would use probably one carrot in my, I see I didn't put it in for my soup, but I'd use an extra carrot. So there you go, I'd use an extra carrot. So I'm already, I've got one, and if I'm going to make a cabbage and carrot salad, a coleslaw, well, then I need another bag of carrots. There you go. And now I need a cabbage. So I need one cabbage. There's my thing. Now I need eggs for my dessert, for my ice cream. I've had two eggs for this, plus I've had five eggs for my eggs in salt water. I need another four eggs, say, for the ice cream. Six eggs because I know I'm making a ginger cake at, at just now. Six eggs for that. And then, depending on what else you're going to use your eggs for. My ginger, I actually now need one piece for the soup, plus I need some fresh ginger for my ginger cake, and I need Sir. So as I'm going along with my menu, even though I'm suddenly thinking of things that aren't on my menu, I can still capture it because it's open. And that's quite an important thing. So when you're drawing up your shopping list, draw your menu first, then put a piece of paper next to you and draw up your shopping list at the same time. I'm very digital, so I quite like to do it on my computer, but a lot of people prefer pen and paper. There's nothing wrong with that. The next thing we want to look at for the food is the cooking times. 
you don't want to serve dried out food. So you need to decide how long is it going to sit in your warmer for and how do you want your meat. You're going to do a roast. Now, this is working it out on 400 gram, uh, 500 gram portions and you would cook 15 to 20 minutes for a rare roast in jet normally. But now it's going to sit in the warmer, so you don't want it to cook too long. So if you prefer more rare than medium, cook it only 15 minutes per 500 grams before putting it in the warmer and you should have a medium rare roast. Depending on how hot your warmer gets, I've had to learn to, my warming, my warming oven is gone, so I'm now using a warming tray and part of it gets extremely hot and overcooks things. When you're doing chicken, you have to be very careful. You don't want to serve pink chicken. But how do you prevent your chicken from also overcooking and becoming tough? So for that, chicken needs to cook until it's no longer pink. So that when you pierce it, the juices run clear. So the first thing you've got to do is cook it at the minimum till it's just done. Then you need to check that there is no pinkness. It can be slightly pink, but not very pink. So when you pierce it, the juice must run clear. And when you cut it up, the bones should be likely pink, but knowing that it's going to be sitting in a warmer for three hours, it's going to continue to cook, especially since it's pacer, so we put everything in gravy. The gravy gets quite hot and it carries on cooking. So you want it just, just done. And then into your warmer, and you'll, it'll be perfectly cooked when you serve it later. Your roast fillets, your rolled roast, those without the bones, like I said, it's 200 degrees Celsius for 15 to 20 minutes for rare, 20 to 25 minutes for medium. Now remember the three hours that it's going to be sitting in the warmer, if you want a medium rare, you have to cook it rare. And if you want a medium well, you cook it to medium. And that's how you'll get your perfect roast. Well done. We're looking at a much higher temperature. One of the things I like, and uh, it's my new favorite toy, is my meat thermometer. I went and bought a meat probe, and you poke it into your meat when you think it's done, and it gives you the correct temperature of your cooked meat. So if you're looking for a rare meat, you want the internal temperature of the meat to be about 60 degrees Celsius. And that's quite important. You don't want to undercook your food and you don't want to overcook your food. Pesach is a great time, but the preparation can be exhausting. And then you're sitting down to a meal and you take one look at your meat and you think, oh no, what have I done? It's enough to ruin it. So how do we decide how much you need? Well, that's easy. In, if you're serving small appetizers, they say that you should have at least a choice of four appetizers and then it's two pieces per person. Uh, this means two of each appetizer. Now, when you're serving the filled fish or Danish herring, two pieces is quite a lot. So I would say that we've got three starters. You need for Danish herring about a quarter cup and for, I mean, chopped herring about a quarter cup. And for Danish herring would be about the same. And then you would have one or two gefil two gefil to fish balls per person. I count three because they go down very well in my house on Saturday night. And then I have extras. Uh, I sort of make a quadruple batch so that I've got for the whole week plus the last two nights. And then I only have to cook once. Your soft drinks, as I said, it's one to two glasses per person per hour. The longer you say that, the more drinks you're going to need. But for 10 people, I would say eight, bo eight two liter bottles if you're serving whole drink. If you're making fruit juices, you're still looking at about 16 liters. Your soup, if you're serving plain soup, no accompaniments, it's a cup of soup per person. If you're serving it with snailach, you can cut it down to three quarters of a cup but it still works out to two liters. Your main course, when you're looking at meat, you want to look at the size. In a boneless cut of meat, 250 grams per person is more than enough. 
If it's got the bone in, you're looking at double that, well, nearly double that, 400 grams, to cut it out nicely um, and to be enough meat for everybody. With a chicken, you can cut a chicken into about 16 pieces. Two of those pieces don't really count. Um, I use the wings for soup and to make chicken stock because there's not much meat on. So unless you've got very small children, then you can make them into a type of buffalo wing where you take off the bony part and you just have like a mini drumstick. Otherwise, you're cutting chicken into 16 pieces. So for 10 people, two chickens should be enough. If you have big eaters, make three. You can always use the leftover chicken to make a chicken lasagna with the matzah. Then your side dishes. So your side dishes, if you're serving potato as a whole thing, make it a, a one potato per person. It's like if you're doing like a potato kugel, a half a potato per person works out well because you're still adding your onion and your matzo meal to it. So you're bulking it up quite a bit. Then you're looking at something like quinoa. It's 40 grams or a quarter cup per person on average. And your diced vegetables, once again, is a quarter cup per person. So that's an easy way to work it out. Ice cream, just under a cup per person, 200 grams. So for 10 people, you want a two liter ice cream. And then your fruit salad is about the same, a quarter cup. And that's how it works out. So a full meal for 10 people for Yantiv, you would have 10 slices of gefilte fish, you would have about a half a kilo of chopped herring and a half a kilo of Danish herring, plus 30 pieces of kefal. That gives you three pieces per person. Eight soft drinks, two and a half liters of soup, and depending on your eaters, but you're working out two to three kilo roast, or two to three chickens. And then you want a half a, a half a kilo of whichever grain vegetable you're having. So your potato, or if you're having quinoa, that's how much. And then your other vegetables work out to half a kilo each, or a 10. And that's working on one starch vegetable and two ordinary vegetables. Your dessert, 10 people, two liters of ice cream, and about two and a half kilos of fruit salad. And that is making your Pesach meal complete and there's enough for everybody. The thing with Pesach is we seem to get into this, I think, a diet mentality where when you're on a diet, somebody says you cannot have and that's the one thing you crave. Well, when it comes to Pesach, we seem to have that same problem that as soon as we can't have it, we, we panic. What are we going to serve? What are the children going to eat? What is everybody going to eat? And I think this is where we all make a mistake, every one of us. We tend to buy things that we wouldn't actually serve during the week. Uh, the sweets, the chips, the chocolates. Do your children actually get that during the week? If, it's, if they do, well then, obviously I can understand you buying all those things. But in my house, we don't get that. So why am I panicking about what it is? What am I serving them? Part of it is because your children are gonna be home all day. Normally, if they're at school and they're busy and they're not bored, so they don't eat as much. And I know in my house, we use a lot of popcorn. So that's another thing that has to change. So for Pesach, I make a, a big ginger cake, some brownies, and if I'm feeling really generous, I'll make meringues. But it doesn't happen often. And then we buy the chips and the chocolate and the and like I was saying, in my house, we don't have that during the week. So what am I buying it for now? Pay for come. Why are we changing that? Why are we suddenly allowing unhealthy foods when the rest of the year we don't? And that's an important thing to remember. Yes, I do buy extra because the kids always have friends over during Pesach. You know, everybody's home and they have friends. So I do need stuff to eat, the same as I would on Shabbos. And then that's something you need to think about. You need to look at healthier alternatives. Um, we have a lot of jelly during the week, you know, uh, during Cholome because it's sugar free and it, it's a free food on a, on a normal diet and the kids think that it's sweet. So we do that. A lot of fruit juice, which I actually don't normally serve during the year. Um, I, I found myself this morning shopping and buying fruit juices 
which seems a bit silly. I don't serve fruit juice during the year. What am I doing having it now? But I just felt that's their treat in my house is fruit juice. And the problem with bought fruit juice is it's full of preservatives. So it's always better if you can, but we can't, make our own. I don't have a juicer for Pesach. Not yet. Maybe one day, <laughs> staying after 25 years. Um, the thing is that, that, you know, if I really want an orange juice or a grapefruit juice, I can squeeze it. And it's a healthier option. You know, it's, there's no preservatives. It's fresh. And I can make just as much as I need. So if I just want a cup of orange juice, I can make it. But this year, I decided I'm buying the orange juice. I did put some back. I took out a lot and suddenly thought, what am I doing? And put a whole lot back. And that's something we all have to train ourselves to do, is to know when you're actually buying out of emotion, out of panic that there's not going to be enough food for the whole week and all that kind of thing, and not buying out of need, because you don't really need, unless it's something you eat during the, you know, perfectly good water available, and from a tap or from a bottle, depending on you. And that's something you also need to think about. You know, we're buying, we think that there's nothing to eat over Pesach, but there's plenty. There's almost as much as during the year. And yet, everybody just overspends. Pesach shouldn't cost you an entire month's budget on grocery for one week. Yes, it's going to cost more because of all the Yom Tavim and all the extra meals that you're having, but it shouldn't be an entire month's worth of budget. And that is what I used to find that I was doing. I would spend the entire month's worth of food budget just for that one week. And this year I've suddenly seen that with the meal planning, I have spent a lot less, and yet I'm still going to have, according to my menus, enough food for everybody. Um, an example for me is tuna. I bought 10 tunas, and I'm thinking, 10 tunas, that's two weeks worth of tuna, maybe more, three weeks worth of tuna. Why do I need so much tuna? I'm only going to make one tuna lasagna. So, so those kind of things are, are stuff that we have to look at carefully. We need to look at what's available, what are you going to do, what is your meal plan for the week, and, and look at it. Honestly, and don't forget that when you're planning for Pesach, you need to plan for the rest of the month. You need to plan your meals for the week after Pesach. What are you serving your kids when they go back to school? So, and leaving money aside for that. So I hope you all have a good Pesach and I hope you enjoyed this. And thank you very much for joining.